This is Rogers TV. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers Cable or Rogers TV. Hi, and welcome back to Politically Speaking. It's a new season. I'm David Shearman. And yes, we're back again at the council tables across Gray and Bruce. And, well, there's lots of things to talk about. My guests today are, Mary, are Mayor Andrea Matrasovs and Deputy Mayor Peter Bourguignon of uh, the town of Blue Mountains. And uh, it's always good to see what's, what's happening to the east of where I am, at least here in Owen Sound. So, Peter, Andrea, welcome. Good to see you both. Nice to see you, too. Thank you for having us. Thank you, David. Now, you had a good summer, I take it. <laughs> Busy. <laughs> Busy? Yes. <laughs> Even though we weren't having council meetings for about a five-week period, um, it, it never stops from the region as well as even subcommittees and, and you know, the mayor's commitments. And um, uh, we just kept on, keep on keeping on, I guess, throughout the summer to make sure we're ready to go for the fall. Um, we had our first cow meetings last week. Um, covering, you know, covering all our departments, and uh, we bring those forward to council this coming Monday. Right, right. And there was a special meeting of um, Great County Council as well. That was a, an unusual twist. Now, I'm, I'm going to have the warden on in a few weeks, and I'll, I'll ask him, but uh, um, Andrea, that was that was a bit of a, a surprise to see in August. <laughs> yes, and and that certainly is the challenge. I mean, we did direct staff to try to pull that meeting together, and and you can imagine with all the different schedules that we have. Um, but the the key part was is that we had great participation from all nine nine municipalities, and thankfully, because it could be done virtually, people could join in from wherever they were. And uh, we've all got some work to do. And yes, I think that's great that you're going to have the warden on to talk more about it. Yeah, because it 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 is indicative of some big changes because it it. it... Well, I, I read the press release about the content, but I'll, maybe I'll leave that for the warden. I'm sure it's, <laughs> it just means more change. It, but it's it, always, yeah, always a good idea to look at holistically. You know, the, the the upper tier is there for a reason. And there are there are times and places where it makes a lot of sense for us to work in unison all together and not keep reinventing wheels nine nine municipalities across. So whenever there's an opportunity, it's worth exploring. And to have nine different sets of policies, which may duplicate or may be very different. And you, when you're dealing with developers, because this is a, a this is planning that they're talking about, it's uh, it's good to have everyone on the same page, isn't it? It's Absolutely. true. David. Sorry, uh, Madam Mayor. It, it, it's true, David. And you know, looking at uh, or people don't seem to realize there's four levels of government. You know, federal, provincial regional and uh, in most cases and then into the uh, into the lower tier municipalities so looking at something like service delivery and there's been a lot of changes at queen's park over the past few years with you know uh, the provincial policy statements and the changes so that can lead into this as well and and not only that when you look at um planners for example and, and I'm, I'm not taking a side either way on this just just overall in the human resource capital there's only so many players in this market and it seems if you know if you if you're if you if you were working here you have an opportunity to move laterally or up a little bit moving to another municipality or a higher tier so what we're doing is we're, it's, it's almost just a, a chessboard with the same players that we just keep moving around onto the board so but looking at opportunities for shared service deliveries, especially things that are, as the mayor said, are getting duplicated in some cases. Sometimes, you know, at the local level, planner will look at it and then some like ourselves have to go to the upper tier for subdivision approval, even though we can take it to red line. So, the, so there, there's lots of opportunity from a regional basis. Number one for efficiencies, number two for provincial um, direction. And number three is to me, I, which is most important is human resource capital. It, it's, it's, there's only so many qualified people out there. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned um, approvals and and so on, but one of the the issues is the provinces keeps changing the the, the rules. Um, the P PPS or provincial planning statements are, I think, we're into the sec at least the second set um, in this legislative session, um, and I'm sure the planners are are. Um, 
at whatever level are going, oh, you didn't oh, yeah. get vacation. <laughs> the directors of planning, you know, and the CAO levels at, at both region and, and lower tier, it, you know, when you see you build, build 23, they build 181, you, you, it, they, and sometimes they're contradicting themselves. And I know, I know things ebb and flow and, and, you know, they're fluid, not static, but when you start laying out course, when you start talking things about like development charges, you start talking uh, about planning, um, secondary dwellings, um, what's allowed by right, what isn't those. And then you do a complete, you know, 90 degree turn when you, it, these are municipalities, they don't turn on a dime. It takes time to, to set the course. And, and, then we have to be in lockstep with our upper tier as well. So the the province has thrown a few curveballs. That, that, that that's for sure. Um, and you know when I have planners explaining it to me, and I'm trying to grasp it. I'm saying, okay, now how's now, now how does the local citizens try to build something, even even understand all this as we move forward? It's it's tough. We're we're, we're trying to adjust on the fly. Mm -hmm. yes. And certainly the the changes, for example, the de development charges that has that has added some extra. The changes in policies has been adding some extra hoops for us to go through with community benefits, such as our campus of care. So you know that has a direct reflection with how we're building this with the developer as well as the long term care provider. So the developer needs to know what do I need to pay, what 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 do I not. That is a project where we are trying to introduce 160 uh, beds for attainable housing in addition to the long term care care beds because we recognize that our healthcare individuals need a place to actually be able to live where they can then provide the services that we so desperately needed. So one of the things that we do, we did just recently come back from AMO. When we come to the province, when we come to the minister's table and, and, and we're able to make a pitch up for a delegation, it's always from the perspective of make use of us. We're the boots on the ground. We're the ones that actually see how these policies play out. And if you're crafting something and making adjustments, please use us as pilot projects. Please reach out to our planners or our experts so that we can actually do something that's workable because we're all on the same page. We all want to have these community benefits and we all want to have more housing, but we need, we know, uh, the deputy mayor and I know that we need the mix of housing here. We don't have a problem attracting developers. So when it comes to things like like provinces try the province trying to encourage more of the 1.5 million homes that's not an issue for us but what is an issue is making it really clear on how we can provide the community benefits that we need such as a good variety to meet everybody's housing needs and developers also want clarity because mm -hmm. they're putting big money on the line for three to five years because that's roughly from what i understand the 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 the, um, the timeline from uh, from concept to um, finished uh, finished uh, buildings, so they're 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 putting big money on the line, and uh, if the rules get get changed, yeah, I'm not sure they're very happy. Yes. That, that that's true. that's most true, and it, and it, it affects everything. You know, they look at a piece of land and they'll say, okay, I'm going to build this land. I'm going to do my P and L based on this uh, on density. I'm going to do this based on what development charges are. And then when that goalpost shifts, it 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 it's a tr it trickles down most definitely. And, or they rethink what they're building. And then that, that hurts into our mix of housing. The mayor is always touted to have a mix of housing, mix of housing. Because you know, we're we are we do have the 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 mansions that surround the golf clubs, but we also do need the the entry level housing. So and then where does the municipality come into play? Um, you know, you talk, we, we use the word attainable. I always use that word and I was, I get corrected once in a while saying that's not really defined by the province. Affordable is defined by the province and that's not a municipal function. That's, that's, that's a, you know, that's from the upper tier. So we have to really concentrate on the mix of housing. And when the goalposts change, especially with DCs, um, and relief from that, um, that's, that's a big, big stop for the developers to take a second look at their at what they're going to be building and where for sure absolutely and then i want to circle back just a, a bit peter you talked about the uh, hr issues surrounding staffing and one of the things i have certainly noticed is that um, municipal staffing is kind of like musical chairs and and you know you just have a new hire you've got a, a new finance director from Collingwood. Um, you know, that's, I'm sure that you, you, your 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 colleague uh, 
Andrea, in, in Collingwood is is uh, quite civil to you still. But at the same <laughs> time, the finance director is a huge, uh, hugely important portfolio in every municipality. Uh, but they all seem to sort of move around. Someone will move for a promotion purpose. Someone will move for additional responsibilities, you know, moving up in terms of size, lots of things. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have enough people? What's what's the reason behind that? Well, we just talked about it. The the housing is definitely connecting to it. And and we are very fortunate that we have a lot of our senior management, for example, they've been here for a while. They've been here perhaps decades and they were able to get themselves into the housing market when it was something affordable that met their price, their price point and their income level. So we do have to be very careful about what's going to be happening because as they age out and start retiring or move on to different locations, uh, we need to make sure we've got a really good professional staff that's growing up through through, through the ranks as well. And certainly that's, you know, why we always look about collaborating from place to place. And, and we're not always on the receiving end of that too. I, you know, we are very excited that Monica Quinlan is joining us. And, and yes, we have an excellent relationship with Collingwood as one of the South Georgian Bay Mayors and CAOs Forum. We, we actually presented uh, several delegations together to the ministry. So we certainly do look for that. But, you know, she's actually stepping in where we had our deputy treasurer for a long time time, Mr. Sam Dinsmore, and he has moved on and up to Bruce County as the Director of Corporate Services. So, you know, we celebrate that for our staff because that, you know, we want to make sure that there are places that they can go and grow their careers. But at the same time, yeah, I, I get kept up a little at night wondering how we're going to be filling those big boots. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's such a, like I said earlier, it's a, it's a chess game. And if I, Ms. Quinlan, I, I, if I recall, um, from another press release, I think she actually went did a stint in Wasega as well. So for you know, so from Wasega to Collingwood, and you'll see, you see the same things. We're fortunate with our CAO at, at the upper level, but um, who you know who is a, who's local and has been around for a long time and knows the ins and outs. But in a lot of cases, when you're getting when you're getting to the SMT, the senior management team, David, you see a lot of change. And there's I don't want to use the word poaching, but you know if a job comes available, anybody's, anybody's allowed to apply for it. We set out the parameters, and there's only so many people with you know a CPA, and there's so many people with an engineering stamp. And those those are the ones that when you know they're like any they're everybody's human, so they always continue to look on what's best for them and their family. Um, you know, I don't think you'd find a better place to live than the Blue Mountains. But as the mayor said, so a lot of times they can't even afford to live in the town that they work in, and that 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 that's brings us back to the issue that we first started talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing, I, I one of the things I've tried to do on this show, curiously, is that when I when I get some staff on. I try to hone in on, on a bit of their vocational background. I have no idea whether everyone ever uh, is, is used at all, but you know, you, it all it takes is a word from someone to say, "Hey, have you considered?" Um, in fact, I was reading something this, this morning um, from someone who is a, a student at Queens, who now knows where she wants to return to, because she lives in Kingston, is not all that happy with it, but prefers to come back to, to Gray Bruce. And, and but you got to know what the qualifications are, because the positions that you're talking about, municipal staffing, are positions with sometimes very high qualifications, such as engineering or planning or finance. Yeah, you, you will see that. And, you know, and then sometimes the parameters set out for that position saying they need the initials behind their name. Other ones say it's experience. So I, the one good thing with our, our current CAO is I believe, you know, he, he's open to looking at every every person that, that applies for the position. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm impressed with with the with the net that he that he throws out and um, sees who he can get in. But but like you said, David, sometimes there are set vocational parameters for that job that have to be met. Um, and and then that narrows your pool even further because say, uh, well, you know, this person has 15 years of municipal experience and uh, five years of, of, um, you know, private, but um, they don't have the designation behind their name. So do they fit into that role? So the, 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 I think all those things play into each other. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and certainly because right across the province, people are looking for planners, they're looking for even, you know, technician level, any any of the stratifications of a municipal staff, that's a job that you can find anywhere in the province, it just needs to match where your family is, where you're, you know, where, where you'd like to, to raise your family, where your spouse would like to work, and and then also where you can afford to live. So it, it's a bit of a challenge that way, because there isn't a specific draw to being particularly in this one municipality so that's why we have to keep working on that and um, it, it's it's it, I know Georgian College does a great job of trying to introduce the opportunities of all sorts of jobs and professions saying you know what you could actually graduate and stay working in this area but the next question will be is can I find an entry-level young professionals a uh, place to live right and often what happens too is that that um uh, entry level positions come ab about of uh, come out of in things like internships or even high school experience, high school work, um, um, you know, uh, work study programs. So it's it's a there's lots of opportunities. People just have to explore them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see that. We see that. So, sorry, Madam Mayor. We see that. Um, you know, say something like bylaws. Somebody's in police foundations, and you know, they, they're. It, it's a lot easier when there's a, when there's a, a specific lane to be in. So you know you're in this, you know, in, in the policing and the bylaws is a natural fit to move into, and they intern or they do summer work or you know even down to what the mayor said about the technicians. You know, or you, you might start. You know, I look at some of our, our staff that has been around for a while and where they started and where they are. Um, I I apply I applaud that wholeheartedly. You know, I, I look at I always make reference to Dan Skelton, you know, CEO of the resort. You know, started working the, the concrete slide ride when he was 15 years old. So, you know, that's that's you know that's just a born bred, you know, st summer student to C level executive in in the course of his lifetime. And and it's that's good to see both in the private and the public sector. And and we do have some people um, at the Blue Mountains that have worked their way up and because you don't get that anymore where you get the 30 years in and, you know, in the, in the gold watch that, that that's, that's not the way today's workforce works anymore. And it, sometimes it's positive and other times it's unfortunate because you could be losing somebody that is such a valuable asset to, to the town. For sure. And, and one, one part of that conversation is too, is uh, when we are where we're at AMO, we had a chance to see the wrap up of the youth that, that have been designated as interns through the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And we were very fortunate because Elizabeth was mentored by the deputy mayor from Southgate, Barbara Do Dobreen. And so she actually came and introduced her to Gray County Council. She did a little shadowing, went around, uh, you know, saw the opportunities that, that, that were here. And in fact, in the presentation that these youth interns uh, provided at AMO, uh, she used the example of the synonym, synonym campus and all of the opportunities that are there for, for entrepreneurs because she had a chance to be exposed to it. And her thoughts were she wants to find a role in a, and a career within municipal the municipal world, whether or not that'll be on the elected side or on the staff side, we, we'll see. But that was because she had the chance, like you said, to experience what it's all about through that internship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, I should, I, I'm going to uh, depart from politics a moment just to give a shout out to my producer, Mark Perry. Um, as we're taping this, he's celebrating 40 years with Rogers TV, 40 years. So he, he, he and he's not looking for his gold watch yet either. <laughs> so congratulations, Mark. <laughs> well, the changes in, in, in TV in 40 years. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I am quite sure that's a whole, that's probably a book Mark will write when he decides to retire. Uh, he's, he's, he's our, our, um, font of all wisdom broadcasting wise because he's been a part of the broadcasting history of Grey Bruce. but uh anyway got to congratulate mark for 40 years anyway um that's a, we've kind of gone all over the map but i did want to come back to um you know the the how circle back to the housing issue and um development because you've had um uh, an interesting development in terms of development charges in town of blue mountains you you've had changes to your revenue as the headline said building has slowed down what's what's the story there what's the back story there the, well building has slowed down a little bit and you, you we did you know we're doing a development charges review um and have made some changes to development charges but 
that's too soon to see this. I, I, what, you know, as the CAO stated, there's ebbs and flows we see all the time with housing. And I think it has more to do with just housing. Like if you look at how many houses, step away from development for a second, just how many are for sale and how many are selling, just the whole housing market, not just, not just locally, regionally, province-wide and in other parts of Canada as well. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, a friend of mine has a house for sale in Laura Bay, only four people have seen it and he's less than I thought he would be. So um, those are the types of things which attribute to a, a slowdown. So then developers are taking a look at, and I've spoken to a couple of them saying, these are just, these are just um, sober second thoughts. Let's just take a pause and maybe it's a small delay. Maybe I, so I, David, I think it's more a matter of timing. We saw another interest rate drop today, which was expected. It was priced in to the index, but they're saying there'll probably be at least two more. So once, once you start getting sub four on interest rates and um, you look at the affordability index from the developer to be able to build number one and people be able to afford to buy that house with a mortgage, I think you're going to see it ramp up. To me, honestly, I think you're going to see a lot of activity in um, late winter coming into the spring market of people ramping up again from a development standpoint. Um, you know, that being said, we you know, the mayor had touched on the, the campus of care. That's a bit. That's a big development in the town that 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 uh, it's going through. It's uh, it's planning right now, and that brings a mix of housing as well. So I think, but the developers have to take a look at that and say what we can afford to build. Uh, we have to, you know, fit in the long-term care home, um, workforce housing, attainable housing, and market rental and sale. So that's that's a to me that's a good benchmark on where we're going to be moving forward from a development standpoint. And the rest of the developers, and there's a lot of them. You can see the signs. You drive a lot, you know, as soon as you leave Collingwood by the Alporn, you're driving um east to west you'll see a lot of the big billboards still you know this development there the land's sold the land's ready to you know ready to go i think the developers are just taking that sober second look based on the market the housing market itself which i think is a, a large indicator of the of the interest rates and i think we're going to start seeing that come back around into 2025. Mm -hmm. it's interesting you say that because here in the here in owen sound there's like four thousand um houses um on the on paper approved for development but no no dirt moving <laughs> <laughs> it's true if you if you if you look at the value of the building permits and you look at the dirt not moving that's that's a very good analogy um the dirt's there it's just not moving quite yet and i i, I think on this is just my personal opinion uh from watching this for decades i think it's you're gonna see the um it's just it, we're, we're at the you know, to use a Blue Mountain analogy, I think we're at the bottom of the hill, and I think we're we're starting to climb back up the, the chairlift to the back towards the top. And I think you're gonna see that slow climb over the next uh, twelve months. Okay. Well, this will be certainly a subject we will come back to because <laughs> it's 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 got there. It's like an octopus. There are so many tentacles out there, as as we've touched on. There's there's staffing. There's uh, development that you want to do with development charges. There's uh, the buildings themselves, there's an on and on and on. Um, but it makes for good conversation. It's it's true. And I, the one thing you talk about development charges is, you know, it's, these are not, these are not, you know, just arbitrarily done. Development charges are done through, uh, through a feasibility study and, and what it costs to actually lay pipe into the ground and bring those services. This is, this is not a matter of, Oh, it's not willy nilly saying, Oh, we're let's charge, a dollar when it's really it should be 10 cents that's not the case so that the, the developers realize that as well and then that they have to price that into the market and what the market can bear so I, we, we have a two we have, it's a we have two forces of nature working right now is the new development charges as well as the slowdown in the housing market but i think once they can factor that out i think that's one piece of the puzzle that will help move forward mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then with our community too, it's, uh, you know, we're, we've been talking a lot about building houses and we certainly do have our, our settlement area is designated, you know, up along the Northern shoreline. So that you know, it spans from Craigleith, which will outgrow the population of Thornbury and, and it, and spans between there. Then we have our infrastructure challenges, like a lot of shale in between the two. So that's always going to uh, be difficult. That's one of the reasons why we look regionally about how we can, we can deliver services. That's why we can talk to Meaford next door and see what's 
happening on their their east side and how we might be able to to go back and forth so we're always looking for that kind of work but the other part of our profile which maybe doesn't come up as much uh you know in sound but certainly your surrounding georgian bluffs is that that we're rural too you know that that we mm. have a composition we always find ourselves in in you know we'd like to be in both rooms at once when we go to these these municipal conferences and they make us choose between small urban and rural because we're both and that has an impact too you know we have to be smart about how we develop and and grow in our development areas because what we don't want to do is push into the desperately needed agriculture that we have to hold on to well as you have pointed out very well that that uh, there's an awful lot of territories uh, to the south to the south of blue mountain that is farming yeah, yeah. so you know no it's be- it, it, that's one of the Nice, nicest drives I think we've got in Gray County. There's we've got lots of great drives in Gray County, but I have to say, Gray Road Forty in the fall is spectacular. It it's is. it's a beautiful area, David. You know, and the when you look at it, and the mayor made a great point on what's you know from the from the from the bay downward or running along there. You know, that's why the topography. That's why when we you know we have municipal services, we have two water treatment plants, we have booster stations, and then you know my property has a, a well and septic. So because I'm just south of forty, so but you you have to look at the beauty of it as well as the as well as the infrastructure. So then a developer can he build there, man, or will you build with all septic and in in twenty twenty five all septic and well? Or are you going to have one-off houses? That's that's and 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 the development uh, and the, the residential development areas of what's designated by the town, secondary and, and primary. So there's there's a lot because of our geography and our topography. There's a lot to consider uh, when it comes to development along that. That's why you see that concentration. You do as the mayor said along along that north shore. Mm-hmm. And that that raises a, another point people aren't aware of often is that the county. And the municipality designates certain areas for settlement, mm-hmm. uh, and and I was involved in a case down in in uh, West Gray, where um, nobody realized that this little parcel of land was actually designated as a secondary settlement area, but it was a farm. Hey, you can't, you can't turn farmland into into an, an secondary settlement area. Well, that was done years ago. <laughs> That's exactly right. And we, we we still have some areas that doesn't need, you, the, you would look at it and say oh that's a great spot for housing and it's designated commercial so you know the, these designations have been put on in place by you know the regions and and the local councils over the over the decades and then that has to always take a look at as well on, on as you move forward say is this do we open up part of the secondary settlement area you know with with the with the official plan review do we look at reduce the commercial space do we look at expanding the light industrial base because or do we preserve those lands in case a factory or you know another bti or somebody wants to come here so it's always it's it's almost like you know looking at the risk or stratego when you're looking at a, a at a map and saying what can what can be done and then the planners will tell you one thing and the and then the the you know the the corporate finance tells you another thing and you have to try to piece these together and the council as a whole has to make a decision as as, as we move forward on what that's going to look like because that sets the tone if you build phase one of somewhere then sure enough there's gonna be a phase two or phase three is coming if the lands allow it mm-hmm yeah, and, this, and we certainly don't have the kind of balance here in the town of Blue Mountains of of a tax base that's that's balanced on re, uh, on uh, residential. We have lots of residential, but not so much as as the deputy mayor said of the employment lands and and commercial is part of that as well as as uh, production and industrial too. We're actually very limited on that side, and and a a good kind of for all the ratepayers involved is to have some balance between the two. So we we have to make sure that we're that we're following our official plan. And when there's something that could be designated into becoming on the, the commercial side of things or or the industrial side of things, we have to, we can't just change that on a whim because that could, that could uh, we'd be kicking ourselves later if, if we gave that away. So, and it's also one of the reasons why when these, these, uh, these proposals come forward and we try to encourage them to come forward early to council to say, here's what we're thinking. We haven't gone, we haven't started the process yet with staff. We haven't done the, 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 the pre, uh, 
um, pre-investigation yet, but here's what we're thinking, and then getting some feedback from us to say, here's what we think the community might need. Uh, a lot of these are coming forward saying, you know, okay, the bottom floor of this particular building could be commercial, and then we could do living on top. And um, that can be done in a very pleasant way that can actually meet the needs of the tax base that we need, as well as providing the services and the providing the economic development and future jobs. So all in one bucket, if we could solve that. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that why they pay you guys the big bucks? I, I absolutely, absolutely. But my favorite is people always say, uh, you know, as the mayor says, anybody can come forward with an idea. I'd like to put a six story building on this farmland. And, you know, the public will say, how can you even consider that or come up with that? Well, we didn't come up with it. Anybody's allowed to present an idea based on land ownership. And, and, and as the mayor said, you can't just willy nilly do that. You have to look at it as how it fits, not just today, tomorrow, a generation from now, but how it fits to the surrounding area, to the tax base, to the services, to the water allocation. So we have to really balance that and anybody like i said anybody it's a silo anybody can come and say i'd like to do this well hold on how does it work so as the mayor said we've been encouraging and we've been getting a lot of uptake on developers coming in early and saying here are my thoughts because if they go too far down the road they've invested too much money and time and then it becomes a, i don't want to say a fight but it becomes a power of will saying well i'm i've already invested uh you know time and money into this project for this and you guys are not allowing it well tell us what you want to do and we'll tell you right away if you can even do it if it's if it or it's a non-starter based on where you are or what you need sure and with that we're going to take a break because um the piper has to be paid as they say although this is this is cable so the piper is already paid <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm David Shearman, and friends, we'll be right back. This is Politically Speaking. Chase Nicholas. I am a Mi'kmaq hockey player. Growing up, I always remember my family talking about the Mi'kmaq as the creators of the game of hockey. In grade 7, I did research on Mi'kmaq hockey sticks as the first sticks of the NHL. I found a Mi'kmaq hockey stick made in 1917, the same year the NHL was formed. I was surprised to find out the very stick I was holding was made by my great-great-grandfather, Alexander Cope. In 1934, an elder known as Old Joe Cope wrote a letter to the Halifax Herald claiming the Mi'kmaq created hockey. I found out later that I am a direct descendant of Old Joe Cope. There was a time when Mi'kmaq children were torn from their families and not allowed to speak their language, losing their words and stories. But the stories are coming back to us. Stepping on the ice, I take pride knowing the roots of the game of hockey stem from my ancestors in the Mi'kmaq nation. Hi, I'm Tiffany James, the host of Her Story. Join us on Rogers TV as I interview various women in our community on how they found success in their own way. Hi, and welcome back to Politically Speaking. I'm David Shearman. My guests today are Mayor Andrea Matrasovs and Deputy Mayor P Peter Bourguignon of town of blue mountains and uh we've we've gone all over the map quite literally from <laughs> one, end, one end one end of blue mountains to the other from urban to rural to to building to staffing my golly we've we've we certainly i'm gonna say we, we covered we covered the whole municipality but there's more there's more um andrea you wanted you wanted to talk about the open fields day they're coming that's coming up 
Yes, this is great timing to talk about it because it's going to be on October 5th this year. And this is our second annual Open Fields Day. So last year was an incredible success. Um, thousands of people were able to go and go on site to designated farms and find out about what it is that we have here in our agricultural community. And this year we have uh, we have we have both returning and new hosts. So we you'll have a chance if you come anytime between 10 o'clock and four o'clock on October the 5th there'll be a map you can go to exploreblue.ca for all the details and decide what kind of route you want to do prepare yourself it would be pretty hard to do all of the five locations because each one has so much to offer there will be the town will have a, a designated stand set up and there'll be some other uh, third party um, areas of interest to to explore there are often good things for kids to do too but these farmers are opening up their farm gates and welcoming us in to find out about what it is they do with their operations so that you can often take an interesting tour and actually go out and follow the farmer and find out a lot more about it it's really important for us to do that because as we said we have to remember that that half of this community is a rural agricultural area and uh, it you know it's not the same thing as just living in an urban area so it's a great opportunity uh, do you want me to share with the locations with you Absolutely, because yeah, that was my next question: is where, where, what, what types of farms are they are being open this year? Yes, yeah, so, so we do. No surprise, we've got we've got uh, we've got an apple orchard available for people to go see. They can go to our deal acres this year, and in addition to that, another stop is to go to the Blue Mountain Fruit Company, which is the packing facility, and have a chance to see a tour through there and find out it's incredible when you have a chance to see these apple processing plants i mean the the mechanics and the technology is you'd never you'd never know what was happening behind those large buildings and it gives you a whole new appreciation for when that apple ends up on your kitchen table <laughs> what what process it's gone through and speaking of apples we also have spy cidery is also they of course they do distillery as well as their apple cider so they they do they distill excellent gin for example and vodka i might say and, and they are located in a rural property, so they are welcoming people. And again, to find out more about how their business, how they produce their product, as well as enjoy the, the products that they offer. And we also have um, people, because we have such an incredible apple growing and fruit growing area here, uh, we often don't realize that there are cows out in our fields too. So we do have Dreamfield Holsteins in Gibraltar, which is really nice and center for people planning out their trips in terms of where to go in the Blue Mountains. There are dairy farm so they are welcoming us there and uh kimber valley farms is also back on this is a return but this time they're focusing uh the, this is the sheep farm that was on the list last year but this time they are focusing on icelandic sheep so those who have been there before might want to go back to have a, a new experience there and they're just on the outside of our border they're just into gray highlands but that's part of this plan is that we make sure that it's a regional uh, regional exchange where people can kind of go across that border and see what's happening just around the corner it is all free of charge there will be extra things that you can purchase such as products or but it is an opportunity to just wear some good footwear come out with the family and explore one two or three locations that sounds terrific especially the the um uh the fruit uh, growing operations and the storage um i'll i'll leave the judgment of the gin and vodka to th to those who experience experience it but that's that <laughs> <laughs> peter raises his hand <laughs> you know i just want to be a team player david always <laughs> well we we do have a lot of great local produce local farms local products that uh, and it, it it, it it covers the the map literally, not just in uh, across. It's across Gray and Bruce, and uh, I've had the opportunity to sample some of these some of these uh, places. And oh my golly, we are so lucky. Uh, I was um, talking to a colleague um, last week actually, and was who was telling me that uh, she and her husband were would take um, short vacations. I said, "Well, where do you go?" Well, we went up to Owen Sound. Oh yeah. Yeah, and we and we went east um, over as far as um, as um, Hollingwood and back, and we discovered all these great restaurants and places to see. And we went up to Wyerton and and. But what really got me, and this is someone who lives down in the Waterloo area, the enthusiasm for the beauty of this area that I think we kind of forget and 
we take for granted. <laughs> I say that. Um, we don't engage our own communities well um, often. And this is a great, sounds like a great opportunity to, uh, to see that. You know, you're, you're right. And over and above that, we ran an economic development campaign called Love Local. And um, that, you know, it hits home. Like when you, we always try to be tourists in our own city, the restaurants and it was the shops and things like that. But when you truly appreciate not just the geography around you, but the, the, the people and the businesses and the farmers and the orchards and everything, it, it, you know, it really, when you take that second, as you said, just to pause and take a look and appreciate the beauty around you, it's incredible uh, that what we have from an, from a natural standpoint, but then, you know, you take something as the mayor said with the, like, even with the apples, like we, you know, I think we've talked about them before, but you know, when you look at the, the co-op, that's a state of the art, you know, facility in the hundreds of thousands of square feet that, you know, can divide apples up by camera angles. So it, this is, this is not just, uh, you know, the local farmer anymore, putting them into a bushel and shipping them down to the Ontario Food Terminal. These are multi-million dollar operations, which have been here for generations and have grown. The industry The industry has grown, but the product has stayed the same or gotten better. So that's, that's really, um, to me, a testament of what people can achieve as each new generation comes forward at the local level. You know, I was I happened to be driving back and forth to Meaford a bit this summer, and I was astonished at the change in technology in the apple orchards. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the old idea of of, a, of an apple tree growing out and up, and you know, using ladders to pick the apples. No, no, it's, they're 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 no higher. They're 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 like grape vines, and they exactly. It looks like an orchard. It looks like a, a, a winery vineyard. more than it does a, a, vineyard, like a vineyard. It does. Yep. Absolutely. And, and they're no they're no higher than than you can reach. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. Yeah. And that, talk about that. That's changing nature's technology yeah. through growing and uh, over over years and years and years. Right? How long it takes to become organic, how many years you need to have. And then it, it, just taking what, like you said, used to have the long wooden ladders and, you know, I, I um, of what you had to do to get to these apples. And now you, you actually change that natural structure as it evolves forward. And that, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And then just the the information and experimental sharing that goes on, you know, that our, our local apple or fruit growing industry here, they have really put their 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 imprint on on how you grow apples in Canada and North America. You know, they're 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 right at the cutting edge. They're trying things out. In fact, I was just just yesterday glancing through uh, the book that was Collingwood Township's final era. So 1977 to 1997, they wanted to finish it off after a very historic book that had been written just before our amalgamation when we became the town of the Blue Mountains. And there were pictures in there that that looked like the precursors to those grapevine looks that we see today. So they've always been thinking about that. There's always another way to do it. And they want to make sure that they can have the efficiency because our farmers need to thrive on these businesses. And, and we know the kind of challenges behind that as well. But it's it's I am very proud of the fact that they make such a contribution to the industry. Well, that's great. And the date again is October, October, October 5th, 5th. Yes. That's Saturday, Saturday, 10 to four. You can choose, like I said, you'd be on a big dash if you want to do all five. So maybe pick your top, top couple and see how you feel at the end of the day. See how the little ones are faring if you're bringing them along. Sure. And, and the, the website again is exploreblue.ca. Nice. Okay. Uh, that's a nice way to see all sorts of uh, the deputy mayor. That, that was his baby. He could tell you more about that. That's a great place to find out what's going on in our town. That's that's true. The Explore Blue is funny, David, and not to I, I hate going back in the COVID time, but that that was our, our director, our manager of economic development, uh, Tim and I, on a Friday night, said we need a website outside of the town website to let other people know what's going on. How can they? And we can't. And you know, there's, there's not a lot of names left, so we can't. We we brainstormed on a Friday night and came up with Explore Blue, and we had it up and uh, Tim and his team had it up and running. I think by the following Tuesday as an information site. Now that's morphed into. Uh, uh, as the mayor said, a go-to site for exploring blue, uh, you know, from we do business spotlights. Um, and so I'm glad that 
something positive came out of that sort of necess necessary information portal that we used and it's still being used today and we have videos on there we have um, vendor profiles we have events happening in the town and explore is it's just a great resource for visitors uh, and locals alike. And it's a nice compliment to the Gray County one, which is Explore Gray. Exactly. So you've got Explore Blue, Explore Gray. Hey, the, 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 the mind boggles. The imagination can work overtime. <laughs> well done. Exactly. Well done. Well, let's move on to a, another subject. I always ask it ask the, in the in my fall conversations with municipal leaders. What about AMO? What what happened at AMO for you, um, Andrea? What uh, what were the, what were the the highlights, the lowlights, and the in between lights? Yeah, and I think um, you know we talked about already about how the policy changes in the province uh, can they can throw a pickle into the works when we've got good projects on the go. So that was one of the topics that we we were. I, I think I've always been very pleased with the fact that we've been quite successful in receiving the opportunity to make these delegations as a town. So we did a number of them. We talked about policy changes, again, saying, please, you know, walk with us on this and help us work on it. We would like some more support in terms of collaboration for our community improvement plan tools. You know, it would be great if they if the province could really latch on to that concept, because that is a fund of resource, a resource fund that we can we can gather up to put Put to good things so that when uh, somebody comes forward with an attainable housing project, for example, there there is some funding that could go that route. If if a developer is designing something that isn't necessarily going to meet that community need, they could then contribute to that fund. That would help us make sure that it benefits the community. Um, so those kind of things we said to the province, that's a good tool. So why don't we make that you know really easy and put some teeth behind it? That that's usually my message to the province. Help us by putting your foot down and saying, everybody's got to play on this even playing field. Now, municipalities, you figure out what that's going to look like. And we had some other things too. Uh, we have a frazzle ice condition that uh, happens here and frazzle ice happens when there's, there's a, a, a the, the water is, there's a lot of turmoil. Uh, I'm not going to use the right word, but when there's a lot of motion going on in the water in the, in the winter, and then there's this kind of freezing that literally sounds frazzled. You know, imagine your hair being frazzled. It doesn't go in the same normal direction that that uh, freezing fibers usually would, and that can cause us problems with our Beaver Beaver River. And we've been able to figure out that we have a dam here. People know the fish ladder and how popular that is, just right down the road here from Town Hall. But by making an adjustment on the level of the water, we can actually try to solve that problem and since 2018 we've been able to do that but we as a town are still delivering large equipment to have to deal with un unforeseen issues of, of ice and this is something that the province needs to walk with us because the ministry of natural resources is part of that so um so those kinds of of things i will also say too that um we also had a big ask on the county level i was able to um represent a uh, great county we went forth with simcoe county and said that what we would really like is if the province would kick in their third so that we can do a massive regional transportation study and really see how this works because this is and we one of our South Georgian Bay mayors and CAOs forum delegations. So on three tiers, we were presenting to to uh, uh, to the ministries is about that same conversation, saying the traffic doesn't stop at the edge of Simcoe County before it goes into gray. And we, as a town Blue Mountains, are that gateway with uh, going off into Clearview and, and Collingwood after that and over to, to Gray Highlands. So we said, please, if you put in 200,000, Simcoe County will, so will Gray County. Then we can get this job done and make sure that it's going to be valuable information that's going to have the data in it that we need to make smart decisions on any of the tiers of government. That sounds very exciting because um, transportation is a huge issue across, across Gray Bruce, but certainly for Gray County. And it does seem we have a bit of a piecemeal system of transportation. And yeah, and it's it certainly doesn't it certainly makes it extra challenging when the province controls Highway 26. So when Highway 26 is 
coming through, you know, dropping people off or taking people on from Wasega Beach, coming right through downtown Collingwood, right through downtown the town of Blue Mountains, both Craigleith and, and Thornbury, and then moving on. You know, so we have to talk to, you know, sometimes we get, you know, residents coming forward to us and saying, well, could you put a, a, a light here or a traffic light here? Or why don't you do roundabouts? That's actually the province who has to make that decision. What we can do is provide them with the data to say, here's what's happening. Here's what your county roads and your municipal roads are doing when they meet that highway. And it's, of course, in Gray County, not just Highway 26, but Highway 10 as well and Highway 6. So um, we do have to have this conversation on a one, two, three level. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a it's a very significant issue. I noticed, for example, that um, um, the uh, Gray County Transit will no longer stop in Dufferin. They've they've taken the Dufferin stops off because the po- it's so popular that nobody that, that they can't put people on. Uh, yeah. So we do have a um, a need for a regional trans transportation network. Well, this this is something that, that what's the timeline for this, Andrea? Uh, you, I, as fast as you know, the province will move. <laughs> but, but, oh, that's a polit- politician's answer. That's right. That's right. Uh, but we're ready, and Simcoe County is ready, and and uh, the representatives from the staff from Simcoe County did a great job of speaking as a collaborative body. You know, this is what we want to do together. And but but the missing piece of the puzzle is a province, and and it's about getting our vehicles. It's about our active transportation, and as well our public transit too. You know we have Gray County provides public transit going along our our corridor, our, our Highway 26 corridor, so people can actually get between Owen Sound and to the far east here in the Blue Mountains. And then we work collaboratively on a regional basis to get people between Blue Mountain Resort and into Collingwood. So this is the kind of thing that we want to make sure that we can we can not not reinvent wheels and not make it difficult for people to get from point A to point B. Yeah. And and there is transportation now from Owen Sound right across uh, to Barrie and down into Toronto, finally. Mm-hmm. Uh, those of us who have been around long enough will remember the days of Grey Coach. Yeah. And I think a number of us are realizing that even if you do have a vehicle that is available for the day, is not going to, you know, have to be taken away from your family to drive down into yeah. Toronto and park in Toronto is it's it's a different ball game than it was even 10 years ago. You People are really second guessing that and wondering, is there a different way I could get there? Yeah, very true. Very true. Very true. So what do you have to look forward to for the fall? I mean, OK, the leaves will change. <laughs> well, sorry, go ahead. Kick us off. No, okay, I'll kick you uh, kick us off just because there is another public participation moment too going on right now with our multi-use and, and I think the deputy mayor may be thinking on the same wavelength as me because uh um certainly in the past term in this term he's been very involved in this this kind of this piece of the portfolio. Um but we have a multi-use uh, recreational feasibility assessment that we're doing in tandem with the town of Collingwood. And again, this is a good regional exploration. So we have currently a survey out there that people can go to and this one is is not quite as easy as explore blue dossier but if they go to our the blue mountains.ca website and do backslash m u r f a so that stands for multi use recreational feasibility assessment that's the way you can participate however the survey is only one way that we're gathering public feedback because we're also doing there have been uh, focus groups for organizations and individuals that are particularly involved in this this particular topic um, and there are pop-up engagements. So when we're already at community events, you know, when people are already gathering, that's a good time to be able to lock in and find out. We're doing really well. We're punching above our weight. We actually have the same number of participants in that survey right now as the town of Collingwood. And we know that there's quite a significant population difference between the two. So it is going well, but we do want to make sure that people put that in. But the thing that we want to really put out there too is that this is about... Um, checking out, getting the feel for what kinds of services and needs are there in this. And this includes our libraries because gone are the days when you think of a public pool separately from a library. They can be in one facility. There is a way in which you can, you know, grandma can drop the kids off for their swimming lessons, go across the hallway and go check out a book. You know, this is the kind of thing that we want to hear from. And this is not to make any decision about a location or a single facility. This 
stage is to do that assessment and find out from the communities, the two communities, what are the needs? Because they were working on it, we were working on it, and we went, wait a second, let's not do this in silos. Let's talk about this together. Mm -hmm. it, it's so important to get the, the reach out. You know, what we did sometimes um, when we look at surveys and, and public engagement, David, you know, we have sometimes we, I don't want to say, we over survey, but we have to. What in this one that the mayor talked about is very important because they're specific asks. You know, so I I, I came to it when we looked at the leisure activities program. I not are you happy with this? You're happy that what would you like to see? Because you know, as much as politicians and planners think we know everything, we need to know what the public actually wants. And you know, we did something with 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 the parks, and I'm surprised that. Um, what people ask for, you know, say not everybody wanted a, and again, I'm just using this example, not everybody wanted a, maybe a swimming pool. They wanted more active walking trails or they wanted, um, they wanted more um, dog parks. So you, you have to look at that, um, that information and re don't just do the survey, use the survey as benchmarks for how you're going to plan. So the reason I like this one is it, it's, it's, it's a multi-use, number one. Number two is because of the regionality, because we know what it costs to build a community center or to put in a pool or another arena or a library. You know, you're in the tens of millions of dollars. These are, these, these, these are large projects. If there, if there can be shared services and shared works, I think that only makes sense. So when the, and I was, I was very pleasantly surprised and actually it made me feel really good to see those numbers tracking almost lockstep with Collingwood when, as the mayor said before, the population gap between us and Collingwood is significant. And that's how engaged the community is on something like this. So I think that that's important, but on the other side of the coin, we also have to be careful on, um, on things like surveys and that as we move forward. I may be by myself on this one, but I, I just, you know, I, I want to know what people want, but I want to make sure that it's we we get the right information by not asking too many questions because it, or too often because then they'll just look at us all oh, even listening. So I think we have very good benchmarks in place for what we do. Um, but that's just that's just that's just sort of one I, I'm always cautious on. Mm -hmm. And and to make sure that we're capturing the voices for for all ages and stages of life, you know, it that it that the, our our busy young parents who are getting their kids off to school and things that, and then rushing off to work, they're maybe maybe sitting down to do a, a survey is not going to be the best way to capture that voice. So that's why we're trying to make sure that we're out there and that we're providing as many opportunities for that input. Um, so if there's something that people would like to explore, this is the time to explore it and and help us make those decisions down the road about whether or not we proceed together or independently. And if we do it together, how does that look? Exactly. Well, this goes back to conversations we've had in the past about borders not being walls, but be but being um, permeable. They have a certain function, but the board about municipal boundaries don't have to be walls they can be bridges mm -hmm. and, I, and i don't mean physical bridges but ways for people to work with each other across across municipal boundaries that's yeah, right. exactly and this is a prime this is a prime example of that you know mm -hmm. it, it 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 truly is because um it, as as the mayor said you know we have to look at you know, we're a east west kind of town and we try to bring everybody together. Um, sometimes, you know, we some some things are too Thornberry centric, or some things are too village centric. And we have to remember that they're all the same body, they're all the same residents. You know, we you know, we have a seven oh five and a five one nine. We have we have an L postal code and an N postal code. So we're you know, we're we're up against ourselves even within our own geographic borders. So if we can expand those invisible walls, knock them down, have some more regionality focus, then it's, I think it makes everybody feel better. It, um, and it also, you know, from a fiscal standpoint, if you can share the costs on these, on these, uh, on, mm -hmm. on these facilities and use as well, the last thing you want to see is a building not being used or not being utilized to its potential when you invested um, the capital resources into it. So I, I think by doing it from this approach, I think it will really help to lay the groundwork on what will be a great um, recreational path for the future for, for the residents in our town and neighboring. And with that, Peter, I have to say, time 
<laughs> Always good to talk to the both of you, Mayor Andrea Matrasovs and Deputy Mayor Peter Bourguignon. We are always good to have those conversations about the town of Blue Mountains. Look forward. Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com. Public transit, garbage pickup, parks and recreation programs, snow removal on your street. How can you stay informed about these and other important local services? Tune to City Council coverage on Rogers TV. See your community leaders at work on Rogers TV City Council coverage. My daughter's been diagnosed with a rare illness. Every night, I lie awake, worried and scared. Your prayers have brought us so much peace and strength.